All right, welcome everybody to day two of the fun training, Introduction to Parallel Programming in Fortran. Uh, so yesterday we talked a lot about uh, kind of the shared memory types of parallelism that are available in Fortran. Uh, this today we're going to talk about a couple of the distributed memory parallel programming models that are available in Fortran. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, before the break, so we're going to talk about uh, MPI and co-arrays and go over like the syntax and features and a couple of uh, little examples. And then we'll take a break for lunch. Uh, and then when we come back from lunch, we'll look at some of the uh, real world examples, kind of the same examples that we looked at yesterday in terms of, you know, quote unquote, real world examples. Uh, and see how we can apply MPI and co-arrays to those examples. Um, then we'll have some time for con conclusions, future work, and answering any questions. Uh, as a little bit of a fun exercise, I put together a little spreadsheet that I'll share with y'all um, just to, as kind of a minor competition to see who can get one of these real world examples to run the fastest. Um, but we'll talk about that a little later, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can have a little bit of fun with that. Uh, so, uh, again, welcome. Uh, some logistics for the day, same basic stuff as yesterday. Uh, we've got the Google Doc uh, for posting questions. We'll try and make sure we monitor that throughout the day. Uh, and a reminder to please go fill out the post-training survey. There's a link to that at the top of the Q&A doc. Um, there's multiple links throughout this presentation, and I'll make a couple of extra reminders. And I'm sure we'll be sending out a reminder email uh, either later today or tomorrow just to remind everybody, please go take that survey. We want to make sure we get plenty of feedback uh, so we can help improve these trainings for you guys. Uh, make, make sure we're uh, really providing some value with this stuff. Uh, additional logistics, um, if you missed it or weren't here yesterday, you can go grab the training materials and examples uh, from that GitHub repository. Uh, we're using the Cray Fortran compiler to run the examples. Uh, like I said yesterday, some of the uh, some of the other Fortran compilers will support these features and you can try them out. Uh, but I just uh, I, I knew that I had tested all of them with the Cray compiler. So uh, and the reservation for today, just a quick note, and I even forgot to change it in one place. Uh, the reservation for today is fun day two instead of day one. But the uh, the same command as yesterday, just changing that one to a two should uh, should get you an interactive session. Uh, so uh, let's talk about um, the parallel programming models that we're going to be talking about today. Both of these kind of fall into the single program multiple data programming model. The idea being that multiple copies of your program will be running executing together and they can communicate with each other so it's the exact same program that does not mean however that the execution path through that program can't take different paths for our different processes so generally what will happen is you'll use some sort of a process launcher like slurm so the s run command if you're familiar with it. Oh, it looks like uh, we're having a little bit of minor issue with the share. So, so like I said, uh, you'll probably uh, be using something like a, a S run command, or if you're on other machines, sometimes they'll use something like MPI run or MPI exec. There's a couple of different process launchers, but basically what that's going to do is it's going to take a copy of your program, put it on each machine where it wants to be launched and launch however many copies of that program you've asked for and coordinate them to be able to communicate with each other. So the typical, you know, simple use cases are something like, uh, I'm just going to break up this big data set and each process is going to work on some, some smaller portion of the data set. And there will be some communication or coordination allowed between the images, but for a lot of cases, you're going to do a fair bit of independent work with only periodic uh, communications between the images. And then at the end, maybe do some sort of uh, gather 
operation where you're going to grab all the data and put it on one image and it's going to do some summary statistics or something like that or write it to a file or what have you so that's kind of the basic idea is we've got multiple programs running on a single data set and they're going to break that break up the work in, in some some way that makes sense for the problem so what does that look like when we're talking about MPI? So the basic structure of an MPI program is going to be that for, uh, for Fortran, you're going to have a use MPI statement. Uh, the modern way is use MPI underscore F08. Um, and that brings uh, the MPI procedures and variables and constants and things like that into scope so that you can make use of the MPI features. Uh, probably the very first thing your program does is going to call MPI init. Then probably you're going to do something like MPI com size which asks how many processes were started. MPI com rank which asks okay what which of those in numbered sequentially from zero to the number that were started minus one, um, which of those am I? And then you're going to do stuff. Um, cool, figure out, you know, how to split up the work, figure out what data set it is, how you want to split up the data, and things like that. And when you're all done, the, the program is going to call MPI finalize to kind of just stop end up stopping the program. Um, so the general rule is that MPI init must be called before you call any other MPI procedures. And I think even reference any MPI, any of the variables uh, from the MPI module. And then MPI finalize needs to be called after all of the other MPI procedures have been called. So that has to be like the last thing that's ha that happens. Um, here's kind of a subset of the various procedures that MPI has available. Uh, this is only a small subset, um, but this is most of what we'll be talking about today, um, just to kind of give you a feeling for what's available. Uh, MPI init, like I said, must be called before any other MPI procedures. And then MPI finalized must be called after all the other MPI procedures, but before the program terminates. MPI com size can report how many processes and the terminology when you're talking about MPI is rank. So rank is a particular process are members of the given communicator. And so MPI has a concept of what's called a communicator and generally that's a way of kind of organizing the various processes. Uh, there's always going to be one that's available that is uh, the communicator between all of the available processes that are running for this job. Um, and for most of the simpler use cases that's probably all you'll need. We're not going to go any, into any of the, the situations where you might have more than one communicator, uh, but that is just part of the API. Uh, it's a concept that MPI talks about. So uh, that the communicator is just a variable that kind of represents what is the subset of processes that I can communicate with through this kind of given channel. Um, MPI com rank then reports the identifier or rank of the calling process in the given communicator. Like I said, that's represented by just by an integer uh, the, and the processes are generally uh, numbered zero to however many are in that given communicator. MPI send is just kind of the generic way of sending data to another given process identified by the rank and communicator arguments. MPI receive is how a process then receives that data from the other process. Um, note that the send and receive operations are a two sided collaborative operation and they both must agree that that uh, on, on what's being sent and received. So 
Uh, if process one says I want to send data to process two, process do, two has to say, hey, I'm going to receive data from process one, and they have to agree on the type and size of that data. Uh, then there's MPI bcast, which is basically says uh, I'm going to send this data to all of the other processes. So there's one process that's going to say I'm going to send data to all of the other processes. Um, and that process is identified by the rank art. The process that is doing the sending is identified by the rank argument. And, you know, all the other processes is identified by the communicator argument. Um, but note that all of the processes involved in this operation uh, must collaborate in the operation and must agree on who is doing the sending. <laughs> Uh, the, and how much data and what its type is, is going to be sent. Uh, so then MPI reduce uh, is kind of a generalized reduction operation, like, i.e., let's do a summation over the data provided by each process in the given communicator. And then the answer is made available to the, the uh, an identified process, uh, the identified rank. So that is um if we if we have a whole set of of processes uh that have calculated some number and i want what is the sum of that number what is the sum of each number that each process has we can do this reduce operation and say uh, process one wants to know the answer with the sum of this variable over all the processes um MPI all reduce is basically the same as the MPI reduce operation, but then the answer is just made available to all the processes in the given communicator. Um, so this is just kind of a subset to start to give you a flavor of what is the what are the kinds of operations that are available in MPI and the kinds of operations we'll talk about today. Um, some MPI best practices. Uh, and a lot of these are just kind of in terms of helping you to get good performance when you're using MPI. Uh, minimize communication. For the most part, when you're talking about communication with MPI, um, it's going to be explicit, but it's going to require some sort of synchronization operations to make sure that, you know, the, the processes that are going to do, be doing the communication either uh, aren't violating any race conditions or, or uh, constraints to try and prevent race conditions and uh, are in the right place at the right time uh, to, to be involved in that communication. Um, also, sending that data can take a significant amount of time because the majority of the time there's going to be some sort of network involved and the latencies and bandwidth involved in going over a network uh, can, can often be a significant overhead if there's not a lot of communicate or if there's a significant amount of data being sent and if there's not a significant amount of uh, computation happening between communication. So you really want to optimize your communications over your computations to try and make sure that uh, you know you're you're minimizing the amount of times that you're doing communication and many minimizing the amount of data that you're com that you are communicating across the networks um, and, and that'll help you kind of achieve better performance uh, to the extent that you can you want to make sure you're interleaving computation and communication so if there's uh, if there's some computation that can be done while you're waiting for the communications to happen uh, you want to try and see if you can fit those in as well so uh, one way of achieving that is let's prefer what's called non-blocking collectors over point to point whenever possible. Um, so something like uh, the send and receive, uh, there are uh, kind of non-blocking versions of those. Um, there are non-blocking versions of uh, some of the other collectives like all reduce, like produce and broadcast. Um, Use those non-blocking versions when you can, and that will help you be able to uh, interleave computations and communications. So you can say, I, I, I need to send this data to everybody, um, 
but while I'm waiting for everybody to get here and be ready to receive it, I've, I've got some additional computations that I could get done. And then later we'll kind of all get together and, and finish over that, finish up that communication. Avoid direct use of MPI com world. Um, this is when you start to get into a more advanced use cases with larger programs. Um, sometimes you want to make sure you want to be able to decompose your program uh, and then maybe decompose in a hierarchical way uh, what processes are doing what what work and if if your program is structured so that everywhere is just referring to MPI com world um, there's a lot of changes that would have to be made to say that oh no this this commute this subset of the processes are going to work on this part of the problem and they're going to communicate through a subset of them so we need a different communicator that represents that subset so you, you'll you'd have to uh, make a lot more changes to your program to, to make that work uh, whereas if you had had the forethought not to just reference mpi com world directly everywhere uh, that might be a little bit easier um, if you've seen some of the older style Fortran programs that are using MPI, you might have say, you might have seen uh, some that say include MPIF.h or uh, the older version of uh, use MPI where it doesn't have the underscore FO8 at the end. Uh, those are all those are kind of deprecated versions. Uh, the, the latest modern version where you say use MPI underscore F08 that really can do a lot more of the interface checking for you. So uh, it will help you catch um, argument mismatches or if you don't have the right numbers of arguments, it'll help you catch some of those errors at compile time instead of just having weird behavior at runtime that uh, then is really hard to, to debug and, and understand what's going wrong. So uh, yeah, definitely don't use the old style include mpif.h. Uh, make sure you try and use the newer style of uh, use the MPI module, and if you can, MPI F08. So, uh, with some of those best practices and uh, just brief discussion, uh, let's go take a look at some of the examples that we, same kinds of examples that we looked at yesterday, but let's go take a look and see how we can add MPI to some of those examples. So starting off with just uh, our hello world example, uh, you know, the serial version where we're just, you know, print hello world. Um, what, what would an MPI version of uh, hello world look like? So like I say, you're gonna have a, a use statement for the MPI module so we can have access to all, to all those features. Um, like I said, the very first thing that uh, the program's gonna do is call MPI init. Um, my, my limited understanding of MPI, because I haven't done a ton of it, is that I think the MPI specification says that MPI init won't ever return a non-zero status argument. It will just crash, but, um, on the off chance, I'm, I'm checking the stat argument. Um, that is one of the arguments to a lot of the MPI functions. Just to make sure it's non-zero. Uh, if if that argument is ever not zero after you return from an MPI call, then something has gone wrong. Uh, and depending on the procedure you're calling, potentially the implementation, uh, the particular value that it has might uh, indicate to some degree what the what actually went wrong. Uh, but anyway, so call MPI init and make sure that nothing went wrong. Uh, call MPI com size to determine okay how many processes are running. MPI com rank to figure out which process am I. And then we can say well hello from rank of how many. And then once we're all done we'll call MPI finalize. And I believe certain MPI implementations won't return from this but I'm not 100% sure on that. And if it's not going to return, well, you'll never ever, you'll never actually be able to even check the stat variable. And I think it won't, I think the, the spec says that it probably won't return with non-zero anyway. But like I said, I just, for, just for demonstration sake, uh, we'll, we'll check it. All right. So, uh, 
with the Cray compiler, we can just compile and run this program. Uh, we don't even need any special uh, compiler options. It just uh, it just works. It sees the M it sees the use of MPI and knows how to link it in, and so it will just work. Right? Uh, oh. Oh, because I have not changed directory into that folder. There we go. So should compile. And then, as I mentioned, for MPI programs, we need to use a special process launcher so that we actually get multiple copies of the program running and able to communicate with each other. So if you've if you're using the reservation and have an interactive session where you used that uh, that s alloc command, you should be able to just use s run and the name of the program. Uh, you shouldn't need to specify it, uh, any of the other options here. But if you're if you're not using an interactive session and so you want to launch a whole job, here's an an example of the s run command that you would use. Anyway, so I'm I'm in the reservation. I've got an interactive session. So s run hello MPI, and you can get hello from each of the ranks of eight. So that, so it launched eight processes, numbered zero, the, zero through seven, and we get a hello message from each of them um, in whatever order they happen to have been able to get their message into the queue. So that's the basics of, you know, th this is all we really wanted to do, but um, MPI, in order to get in order to get that far, required a handful of uh, subroutine calls and then uh, finalized to finish up when the program is done. But then we can say hello and see that we're doing parallel execution. All right, so the other somewhat simple example that we've got was the, the matrix multiplication example. So where we had uh, just let's get a uh, couple of matrices full of random numbers uh, and then we'll do a matrix multiplication on them and print out the result and see how long that took. So what does that look like with MPI? Um, so once again we have uh, call MPI init to, in order to be able to initialize all the MPI stuff. Uh, we'll determine how many processors are running and which one am I? Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to have the, the very first process uh, determine what the matrices, what values the matrices are going to have. But the other processors, they're going to need to know what are the values in the matrix. So we're going to have process zero send those two matrices just do a broadcast of those matrices just send it to all the rest of the processes so now everybody knows what are all the values in the matrices that we're going to be working on uh, and then uh, we're just going to have process one do the uh, the timing and then we're going to do the matrix multiplication uh, you'll see i added the the arguments for which process am I and how many processes are there to the matrix multiply subroutine. Um, in this simple example, that, that subroutine's in the main program, so we would have access to those variables. But best practice is probably going to be either um, you'll end up calling MPI com size and MPI com rank all over the place, or you're going to be passing these as arguments to places so that you kind of know these pieces of information because most of the parallel algorithms you'll write will be in terms of which process am I and how many of them are there. So uh, we'll still have our sanity checks uh, to make sure the sizes of the matrices make sense. Um, we'll actually need a local variable now. Uh, and it's and we're going to allocate it to be the size of the matrix that's going to be the output. And now we're going to do what's called domain decomposition. Um, 
each process is going to take a subset of the rows of A in order to do the calculation locally. So it's going to do um, all of the columns of B and all of the columns of A that correspond to the rows of A. Uh, it's going to do those operations to, you know, sum up the sum up the uh, the intermediate uh, terms in the multiplication across the rows and columns of A and B, uh, and then once we're all done, we're going to do an MPI all reduce. So this is going to let everybody else, everybody know the answer. What is what is the answer when we multiply the the matrices A and B, and it's going to use the local C as the input buffer. Um, MPI talks in terms of what's called buffers. So what it what is the input data that we want all of the processes to be working on, and then where do we want them to store the answer? Um, if you try and use the same variable in both of these places, weird things will happen. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the other arguments is how big is the data that we're going to be working on? Uh, what is the type of the data? So we're just using default real uh, variables here. So it says uh, our type is MPI real. has So MPI has a, a constant that specifies, allows you to specify what the type of the data is. And what is the operation we want to perform for this reduction? We want to do a summation. So MPI sum is another MPI uh, value. Uh, we're working on the whole world and the stat uh, argument as uh, an intent out. So, so we'll do we'll do portions of the matrix multiplication broken up across all the processes that we've got. And then we'll put the put the answer back together and, and make sure everybody gets the answer. Um, once we're done with the multiplication, we'll uh, uh, process one. We'll check on the timing and a sanity check to print out the matrix and tell us how long it takes. And then when everything's done, we'll do the MPI finalize. All right. So does this work? into the matrix multiply example. Again, we don't need any special arguments to the compiler. In this case, it just sees the MPI stuff and knows what to do. And, but we do need to use the S run command to launch the executable. And our matrix is smaller than the number of processes, but I think that should work out because it just means process zero and one should do the two rows and do the calculation. I think this should work, but it's Sure, taking a minute. Yep. Let's kill that and then we'll try uh, we'll try making the matrix as big as we were using yesterday. Boy, that is it's not like that. Yeah, I'll kill that one. There's the S Alec. Oh, uh, day two. Let's see if we can get my 
interactive session back and running. Says ready. There it goes. CD matrix module load prog and pray. Um, and then we should be able to do compile FTN MPI. Compile and S run. There we go. So if you, if your matrix is big enough, then all of that looks like about the right answer. So if we want to, we can try the OpenMP and see if uh, the numbers look about the same. Yep, they look about the same. So. So yeah, you can have the different processes work on different portions of the uh, matrix multiplication and then do collaboration to put the answer back together. So that's kind of the basic examples of how can we do some problem decomposition to use MPI. Um, and so one of the things I'll point out here is when we were working yesterday with uh, do concurrent and OpenMP, there wasn't really much that uh, you as the programmer had to do to, to kind of decompose the problem and figure out, you know, what, what process is going to be working on which part of the problem. When you start to get into uh, to the, the programming models like MPI and co-arrays that are doing distributed memory calculations, um, you as the programmer really have to start thinking a lot more about how do I decompose the problem and coordinate which processes are going to be working on which parts of the problem and what data do they need access to when they're going to be doing those calculations and then who's going to need access to the answers. You really have to start uh, thinking more as the programmer about what does the data flow look like? What does the problem decomposition look like? And how do I put all that stuff back together? So um, the, the downside is that they're more complicated. The upside is if I really need the compute computational power of more than one machine, there's no getting around distributed memory calculations. So if I really need more than you know, if we're talking, if we're talking, you know, uh, commercial grade, like, you know, eight or 16 core machines and you need more processing power than that, you're going to be going to something like MPI and trying to use more than one machine. Especially on, you know, when you're talking about Perlmutter, if you want to scale to the size of a machine like Perlmutter, even, an, even a node that has 128 cores, but if you really need more than 128 cores, there's just no way that you're ever going to have a machine that's not going to use something like MPI or co arrays and be doing distributed memory calculations. So, all right, so those were the couple of MPI examples. Why don't we stop briefly for questions and see if there are any questions on usage of MPI? All right. What does Fortran num images report in an MPI program? Well, technically num images is not an MPI procedure. Uh, so really it's allowed to report whatever it wants. That said, a lot of Core implementations use MPI. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit when we start getting more into to the co array discussion. Chances are probably pretty good that you could use num images in an MPI program and get the right answer, but I wouldn't recommend it. What's the purpose of passing the optional stat argument to the MPI calls and then not checking it? Um, so I showed the example of checking it in the simple hello world example. And then you're right, I didn't check it when I went to the more complicated matrix multiplication example. Um, it, if you're not checking it, yeah, things could go wrong and you wouldn't know. And then generally when things go wrong, 
um, something else is going to go wrong later, and then you're going to be confused about what went wrong. For the purposes of these simple examples, the chances of anything going wrong and crashing are pretty small, and so not checking it is just an admission that, you know, I there, there's nothing I was going to do to recover from it, and so if anything goes wrong, I just it's a simple example. We'll just kind of uh, we'll just kind of debug it from there. But uh, yeah, best practice if you're going to be working on a larger project, you're going to have some, you, you know, you're going to you're going to try and do some error handling to help with debugging if things go wrong. Yeah, you should be checking the stat argument and and trying to do something about reporting to the user, you know, wh where are we and what's gone wrong. Um, shouldn't subroutine check stat call error stop instead of stop on error? Um, potentially, it in this case it doesn't make a huge difference. So stop will stop the program. Error, error stop says that is more of a co-array feature and says that all, all of the co-array images will stop when any, when any image calls error stop. Um, so using error stop in an MPI program is fine. Either is probably sufficient in this case. Could you draw a cartoon showing the domain decomposition for the matrix multiplication example? Um, okay, so Zoom does have a whiteboard feature. I have not used it much. How do, let's see, annotate? Oh boy. So oh. there's a button whiteboard down below. Try that. Okay. Next to like share screen. Uh, I don't know what just happened because now I can't see my screen. Let me stop sharing real quick. Okay. Hang on. Let's see. Whiteboard. New whiteboard. Okay. Um, let me rearrange things here for a second. So I can see what I'm drawing. All right, uh, cool. So, so we've got a matrix. One, two, three, four, and right. Writing numbers is really hard with a mouse. <laughs> um, so if if we've got two processes that want to do a matrix multiplication here, so we've uh, we're going to have two, two matrices, five, six, seven, eight. So we're going to have matrix uh, process one is going to work on this row, and process two is going to work on this row. So the answer is going to be um, on process one, and then we'll on process two. So process one is going to do one times six plus three times. Uh, oh, I uh, one one times five plus three times six. Right, and then uh, uh, one times seven plus. Uh, where's the eraser? Eraser pen. One times seven plus three times eight, and so. Those, since it's only going to work on those row, that row, the other values on that matrix are going to be zero. Since, since process two is only going to be working on the bottom row, it's going to do two times five plus four 
times seven. And over here, what's going to do two times seven plus four times eight. And I understand that that is all terribly illegible, but so, so now the, the two processes have different portions of the matrix that they have uh, done the multiplication for. And then when we do the summation, we go element by element to add the answers together. So we're going to get, what, uh, 18 plus 5 is 23. And we're going to go, right, and because it was 0 over here, so that's 23 plus 0. And then, let's see, 24 plus 7, 31. Again, plus 0, because we're going to add those two together. And then down here we get 0 plus, let's see, 4 times 7 is 28 plus 10, or, or no, 2 times 5, 4 times, that should be a 6. There we go. Um, 24 plus 10 is 34, right? So that one plus that one. Right? And then 0 plus 2 times, uh, 4 times A is 32 plus 1446. Right? That one plus that one. Right? So the summation operation puts the two, puts the two answers back together. Oh, so we get the right answer. And then everybody gets the right answer. So that that's kind of the the order of operations when we're trying to do a, a decomposition for matrix multiplication. Um, lo, um, real world problems start to get significantly more complicated than that. Um, but in this example, it just kind of works out um, that, that you can just do it in this simple operation of let's just uh, do row by row decomposition. Um, one one aspect that can that you can uh, that that will come up here is what do we do if the matrix is bigger than the number of processes we have? And we can go look at the example again. Basically, what we're doing is. Uh, it, the way the way I've implemented it here is we're actually uh, skipping rows by a number of processes. So if we were going to come, uh, oh, I'm not sharing, but uh, I will demonstrate what that looked like. Can I, is there a just clear button? I think I can just do new whiteboard, right? Whiteboard. New whiteboard. Okay, here we go. So, so if we've got a three by three matrix, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So process two or process one is going to do that one and that one, and process two is going to do that row. Um, and so we've just kind of inherently done it that way by how we've structured the do loop.
So let me close whiteboard, share my screen again, and we'll look at the, the source code again. So the, the way I did the, the decomposition was um, to just increment the, the loop counter by the number of processes. And so, so it, will space, it will space those out in that way. And so um, that way I don't have to do the math manually to figure out if I wanted to break it up. Well, process one gets rows one and two and process two gets row three. Well, then I don't have to do the math to figure out, well, which processes get more rows than the others. This just kind of inherently um, process one will go, well, I get row one and then row three and process two will go, I get row two and then, oh, well, there aren't four rows, so I'm done with the loop. So this was just a technique to, to make the, the decomposition easier. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So we drew out all that. Does MPI accept user defined types? Um, I, for send and receive, I think it will work. I have not tried this. Um, so if your derived type has allocatable components, I almost guarantee it won't work. If it does not have allocatable components, so if you've just got like a, a derived type that's just got like uh, a, uh, a an integer and a real just together, you could probably make it work by just knowing what the sizes of things are and being able to specify the sizes correctly it will probably work. I don't know what the uh, specification says about that though. So somebody says that they have said that it works, but yeah, so send and receive, probably you can make work, send, receive, broadcast. But if you're trying to do like reductions, that's probably not going to work right. So You'll have to go, I, I recommend going and reading the specification, the MPI specification to try and understand what is, what does it say should be allowed. Should one use MPI abort for non-standard termination? Um, I, like I said, I haven't done a ton of MPI programming, so I am not entirely sure. The, I would read, I would recommend go read the documentation on MPI abort. If you're doing MPI programming, you should be able to use whatever MPI procedures you want. I wouldn't worry much about that. So, so Brad, there's another question on top of the questions you answered. Yep. Could you explain again the reason why we should avoid direct use of MPI common world? Um, it will it will help you in the future when you want to. Uh, make modifications to how you do the problem de decomposition. So um, there, there are certain types of problems where you want to segment the processes and uh, MPI has features that allow you to do that in an easier way than having to, you know, determine based on rank uh, number, process number, which, which path should I take. Um, you can do stuff where like if I'm a member of this world, I should go do these calculations and then all the communications that happen happen in terms of this MPI com. You're talking MPI. about common split and it was sub com, common word thing. Okay. So if, if you've done an MPI com split, which again is the more advanced stuff that we're not going to go into today. Uh, it's commonly you, used in the climate models with yeah. which you have different components and was a separate uh, common world. Yeah. So yeah, the yeah the weather models do that pretty frequently. The, they'll have uh, uh, what one they'll do an MPI com split either once or twice at the beginning of the program. So it's you know 
this portion of the com so here's a communicator for all of the images or all the the ranks that are going to work on the C model and here are, here are all the ranks that are going to work on the the atmosphere model and here are all the ranks that are going to work on uh, the land model etc um, and then so those operations can happen in terms of a different communicator than NKI com world and so making the transition to being able to do that is easier if you didn't just hard code everywhere to be doing communications in terms of MPI com world. So it's a it's more of a, a future proofing type thing than a, a don't do it period. Okay, back to slides. And now I think we can start talking about co-arrays. So uh, here are some examples of the co-array syntax. Um, so co-arrays work uh, slightly different than MPI. Co-array communications are one-sided. So we're going to specify ahead of time variables that can be accessed from other images. And we use that using the square bracket syntax. So if we have a variable declaration where there are square bracket where square brackets appears, that means that other images and where MPI uses the term rank, coarray uses the term image. So another image will be able to access the data in that variable. Then the access to the data in that variable also uses the square brackets and an image number to identify which image do I want to access this data on. So it allows one-sided non-cooperative communication of, of data between images. There are also some collective operations. So like co-broadcast says, um, the source image is going to send this data to all the other images. Uh, there, are, there are a handful of other collective subroutines. Um, let's see, there are five of them, I think. Uh, so co-broadcast, co-sum, co-min, co-max, and then there's a generic co-reduce, which lets you specify a procedure that you want to use for the, the reduction. Um, and so the, those are those are the intrinsic kind of built-in collective operations. And if you need additional collective operations, uh, you can build them in terms of the others without a ton of uh, a ton of work. Um, there's also some coordination operations that are available. So sync all says all the images are going to wait until they've all gotten here. Sync images is kind of how we do. Uh, point to point synchronization of like, hey, I want to synchronize, I want to wait until those images get here. And that is a somewhat two sided operation that if I say that I want to wait for that image, that image says that it has to say that it wants to wait for me. And so you have to have balanced uh, specification across images of like who's waiting on who. Um, where MPI had com rank and uh, com size, uh, we've just got this image and num images. So which which image am I, and how many images are there? Um, so those that's kind of uh, the that's most of all the syntax that you really need to be able to talk about coarrays. So the way coarrays work is all of the images already start. Um, you, there's no MPI in it. There, there's no co-array in it that needs to be called. Um, it just inherently the the program starts with however many images the launcher told it to, um, and there's no need to call any special uh, stop routines. Um, stop is a collective operation, so all of the all of the images have to call stop if you want to stop. But if there's an error condition and you want the whole world to stop, error stop being called by any image will just stop the entire program. Um, 
Let's see. So some of, some of the co-array semantics. Co-array access without co-indices, co so the, the number that appears in, in square brackets, denotes the current image. So, so if I've got a co-array variable and I don't put square brackets in a place where I'm using it, that just means I'm not doing, I'm not actually doing communications. It's equivalent to just specifying that variable on the image that is currently executing. Co-array accesses require no participation from the remote image, i.e. there's no need for a matching send and receive. Um, the collective subroutines and sync all are all collective, right? So, so if we call co-broadcast, all of the images better call co-broadcast. Uh, and then it will wait until all of the images have started calling co-broadcast and none of the images will leave until they've all gotten the data. Uh, sync images must be symmetric between image pairs. I just talked about that. Like if image one says I'm waiting on image three, image three better also say that it's waiting on image one. Uh, Co-array execution. So only unconflicting co-array accesses from a single image are guaranteed to be consistent without what are called image control statements. So an image control statement is a way of ordering execution between the different images. So for example, um, on the left hand side, this will definitely print the number 42, right? If, if this is the entirety of my program, it is guaranteed that image two will print the number 42 right because it's the only thing that's going to access that's going to ex execute any executable statements it's going to say um, it's sending the number 42 to image one and then reading reading that variable from image one and since there's no since image one isn't doing anything to that co array uh, at the same time uh, we know we're going to get the, the number 42 but if you don't do image control statements, the order of execution and communications is undefined. Uh, so, you know, if image one is going to store the number one into co array into the co array variable, and then image two is going to try and store the number forty two into the co array variable on image one, it is, in, and then later. Uh, both image two and image one are going to try and print um, the co-array variable. It is completely undefined when this assignment happens as far as image two is concerned and when this assignment happens as far as image one is concerned. And because we're going back and accessing the same thing, it's undefined whether this assignment happened uh, between when this assignment happened and we went to read the value again or whether this assignment happened then this assignment happened then uh, then print then so this will get so it's undefined whether either of these print statements will get 1 or 42 it's actually even undefined whether image two will be able to print the value 42, but image one ends up printing the value one. So it is entirely plausible that image one does this assignment, image two thinks it did this assignment, and then prints the value 42, but image by the time image one prints prints that value, it hasn't seen the image to the image two's assignment come across the network. And so it's still seeing the value one. Uh, so image control statements are sync all sync images, um, sync memory. But that is has some additional semantics that leave it more loose ended. Um, 
and then you can use what's event, what are called events, event variables. Uh, we're not going to go into those today, but that's another option for how you can kind of coordinate um, and have uh, some ordering of uh, what ordering of execution between images. So this is an important thing to think about when you're starting to use call arrays is you have to think about the order of operations between the images when you're accessing the call arrays because you don't want you know you don't want one image to be overriding data that a number another image needs um, before it's done accessing it. Um, so the call array best practices are to the extent that you can you should minimize synchronization. Because, uh, so I use sync all sparingly because part of the whole reason that we're doing parallel programming is to be able to speed up our calculations. Synchronization means we're waiting, meaning we're not doing any calculations. So it is inherently a wasteful operation in terms of you know, computing resources and because rather than us being, you know, busy doing calculations, now we're just waiting. So to the extent that you can avoid those, uh, you should. Use coordination to ensure that the read and write are ordered between images. So that example that I just kind of went through, you need to use some sort of coordination to order the operations between images. So if we had like a sync all statement, after this if block, then image two, yeah, one sync all actually isn't even sufficient in this case, right? You'd need a sync all between this if block and this if block, and then it's guaranteed that both of those images, so image, uh, both of those images would end up printing the number 42. Right, because if, if you only had a sync all here, then it is not uh, defined whether this, this assignment would happen before that assignment or not, and this could still print 1 or 42. Okay, um, so let's go look at the examples. So we'll start with hello world, right? So our serial hello world. So what does a parallel hello world look like when we're doing co -rays? Um Technically, we didn't have to change the program at all. So here's a little bit of trivia. Does anybody know what the shortest standards conforming uh, Fortran program is? Anybody? I think I covered this in the last uh, the last training I got uh, I, we gave. Uh, stop. That's a good question. It's three characters. End. The shortest standards conforming Fortran program is end. Does anybody know what the shortest standards conforming co-array Fortran program is. Any guesses? It's also end. Fortran is inherently a parallel programming language. The, if you compiled the program end, with a compiler that uh, implements co-arrays uh, and assuming that you needed uh, a special flag to turn that feature on, you can launch a simple program that does nothing with multiple images. All of the images will, will start, um, they'll get to the end of the program, they'll wait for all of the images to get to the end of the program, and then the program will terminate. All right, so the simplest uh, the simplest possible Fortran program is also the simplest possible 
parallel Fortran program. So we didn't actually even need to change this print statement. This is just so that we can kind of see that, yes, in fact, uh, there, there is some distinction between the images. Um, but uh, as an interesting example, so when I compiled Hello Serial, right, just this Hello World, uh, we're using the Cray compiler, so it's just a, you know, Cray compiler program dash O, right? I don't actually, the Cray compiler has coarrays on by default. I don't actually need to spe specify any special flags to make use of the coarray features in my programs when I'm using the Cray compiler. Meaning, um, we still need to use srun to do to launch multiple processes that can do the communication between each other, but it means that that hello serial example program that I've already compiled yesterday already is a coarray Fortran program. And when I do srun, assuming uh, Slurm wants to cooperate. I get eight copies printed of Hello World. Now, you can't see any distinction between them as to whether there were any communication actually happened or uh, any distinction was made between the different uh, executing images. So we add some things to the print statements to make that more obvious. So if we, if we compile our example coarray program and then s run it can't quite tell if slurm is slow or What's going slow? Hmm. Anybody else having tell your budget office that you need a faster supercomputer? Yes. <laughs> uh, step, cre step creation temporarily disabled. Requested nodes are busy. Can somebody take up the whole node? I know I'm in a shared queue at the moment, but uh, or uh, shared node at the moment, but maybe that's what's going on. If you want to try a dedicated mode node, you can just ex yeah. exit that alloc and just ask for a whole node without doing dash q shared. Yeah. Just remove dash q shared, remove dash n8. That'll give me a whole node. Yep. Now, will that work if any of them are... Ah, looks like it gave it to me. Okay. CD, hello. So S run, hello, co -rays. Oh, we should get uh, 128 now, right? Yeah, dash N. Dash oh, N. Oh, but since put that dash N on. Uh... Oh, I missed a space. There we go. Oh, that's weird. The command prompt showed a space, but somehow it thought I didn't have a space. That's strange. 
wonder if uh wonder if my bandwidth is somehow getting confused. Hmm. Is something wrong with slurred? Yeah. Shouldn't be this slow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Working okay when we did the MPI example. Okay. Let me try. try a different logging node, meaning you actually log out and log in again. Or. Well, at this point, I'm not on a login node, right? Right, but that sometimes, you know, so, wherever you're coming that? from might be an issue. And. Yeah, it's slowing down the MPI example now, too. That's bizarre. Okay. Um, okay. Don't know if, I don't know if that goes to a different... So SSH logging something to a different node. Yeah, any number. Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay, that worked okay. Uh, there's that s alloc command. Grab that real quick. s alloc. Copy. experience slurm is the least reliable piece of software on Pearl Butter. Huh. Okay. I'm sure that's believable. Let's try this. Yeah. Where am I at now? CD repositories fun. Parallel. Samples. Hello. S run. Hello, co-arrays. Bus error. Can I even specify like just two? Why is it not like? Okay, well I can get two of them to run. Can you put a dash N1 in there? I mean, oh. Yeah. So it will run two. About eight. About seven. Okay. I can get seven of them to run. Oh, I think I saw this happen to me when I was testing stuff out the other day. Where I did an S alloc and I and I requested eight no, um, eight processes or eight tasks, and I couldn't run eight images. But I don't know why. Am I going to have the same problem with MPI? So MPI can run all eight all eight ranks. I see. Color rays doesn't seem to be able to run all eight images. This is a problem I'm going to have to debug later. So, <laughs> specify less less images than you uh, requested. And things should work. But it does still seem to be moderately slow. Also randomly slow. Mm -hmm. Remember you saw this like something something disabled trying again. That means Slurm is being um, overwhelmed. Maybe oh. by someone else, you know, pounding on, on the scheduler. Yeah. Well, we will try and uh, make as 
make as much progress as we can running the examples, but hopefully, hopefully Slurm uh, can recover. Yeah, that's bizarre. Okay, but well, as you could see for the from the time that it did run, uh, it can tell how many images are running, and we can tell which one it is. So we can get a, a hello world example to run with uh, co array features. You don't even need to declare any co arrays. You can still just start making use of the co array features, and that one finally did run. Okay, uh, the other example. So let's get over. Let's go over to the matrix example. All right. So, like we did in the MPI example, we're just going to have one of the images uh, generate the the values for the matrices, uh, and then we'll do a broadcast to send those matrices to all the other images. Um, just like with MPI, all of the images that are going to call this co-broadcast have to agree on who is who, who is the one sending all of the data. So all of the images, so because this value is hard coded, all of the other all of the images are going to say, you know, image one is the one doing the broadcast. Um, so those will all agree. Uh, again, we're just going to have one of the images do the timing. Um, and we're again going to pass the me and number of images uh, values to the matrix multiplication. And then we can do the exact same decomposition. Uh, so the images, the images with co-arrays are numbered starting with one. Whereas uh, the ranks in MPI are numbered starting with zero. So if you're if you're comparing the two, you'll you'll notice that for the MPI example, I said me plus one, so that uh, rank zero started with the first row. Uh, but uh, the images in co-arrays are numbered starting with one, so I don't need the plus one. So image one will start with uh, row one. So it's the exact same decomposition. We don't actually need the intermediate variable when we're doing things with co-arrays because uh, the collective subroutines can correctly, are supposed to correctly account for um, buffer overwrites or whatever. Um, so cosum says do a summation across all of the values between images for all of the elements of these arrays. So it's the exact same correspondence of element-wise, but across images do a summation. So the exact same, basically the exact same operations that we were doing in MPI, uh, the, the collective summation just uh, ends up looking a lot simpler. And we don't need the intermediate variable. So change directory over to that example. Again, for uh, with the with the Cray compiler, we don't need any special flags to use the coarray features. So we can yes, with the Cray compiler, we don't need any special flags to use the coarray features. And actually, this example also does not have any co-arrays. So there, there is actually a lot that can be accomplished using Parallel Fortran without the need of actually using co-arrays. Um, you know, so something simple like this where we're doing a matrix multiplication, we can just decompose the problem and then use the collective, uh, collective subroutine to do the communications as necessary. Yeah, there, there's a lot of cases where that, that ends up actually being the case and you don't really need explicit declarations of, of co-arrays. But now that it's compiled, we should be able to run, well, we'll try it with just seven. Actually, uh, I didn't change the matrix sizes, so let's just try it with two and 
see if that works. See if Slurm will be nice to us. Yeah, there we go. Um, let's change the sizes to whatever we were using for MPI and see what happens. See if we can use eight images. Let's see what happens if we say we want eight images. Uh, I see the question, do you need a ninth process for the main program when having eight Cori images? Um, you're not supposed to. I don't know why it seems to think we need a spare process. Because there, there is not supposed to, you're not supposed to need any spare process for co-arrays to work. But for whatever reason, it seems to want one today. I am going to make sure and ask that question of HPE and see why their compiler seems to want an extra, an extra process in there, or at least have one available. Um, but let's see what does the um, MPI version think when we run seven processes. So they take uh, roughly similar amounts of time, it seems. Well, assuming Slurm behaves. Yeah. So they will take roughly three and a half milliseconds. Yeah, so they're, those are supposed to be, like I said, um, for the for this type of problem, MPI and co-arrays, the solution ends up looking very similar, but, um, but the co-arrays features can actually simplify the program a fair bit. There's, there's a decent amount of things that, that aren't required that, that you would need uh, for, co for MPI. So, uh, where were we? Co-ray examples. Okay, cool. So let's see. Are there questions regarding the co-rays? Will code written in co-rays compile and run in serial? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, the G4Train compiler has an option where um, so uh, co-rays aren't supported directly in the G4Tran compiler, there's a project called Open Coarrays um, that is kind of an external library. So, so G4Tran will use that to support uh, the Coarray features, but that has to be installed separately. But if you've got code that uses Coarrays and you just want to be able to compile it with the G4Tran compiler, but you don't have Open Coarrays installed, you can say, no, I want G4Tran to compile it to work with just a single image. And so then you basically get a serial version that ha has the co-array features, but it just only supports execution with a single image. Um, I, think, I think the Intel compiler also has a similar option, but if you install the Intel compiler, you get their co-array runtime library anyway. So I don't, so it's not really as necessary. Um, but yeah, so you can, and you can always say, Hey, I just want one image, right? So that S run command with more processors. I only asked for, Oh, why does it think that there is a seven in there still? My terminal appears to be acting goofy, but yeah, you can you can always just request one image. You can do the same thing with MPI, by the way, right? 
So there's right. You can you can run an MPI program with one rank. So um, yeah, that that comes back to my point yesterday when we were talking about OpenMP. Um, don't write code that assumes more than one image. That, that's, that's one of those best practices is not to write code that assumes that there will actually be more than one process running. Because otherwise you can't, you know, try and run it in serial. What is the optimal number of processes images in general in co-arrays? It depends on the problem size and what type of problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm trying to multiply a couple of two by two matrices together, well, there's no reason to have more than two images. But it, if I'm trying to multiply a couple of thousand by thousand matrices, then maybe I want to try and scale across like 30 or 40 nodes in Perlmutter, right? So it really is dependent on problem size. How do I overlap co-array communication or Fortran collectives with other related work? So in theory, the compiler is allowed to do it for you. Um, we don't have this exam. We don't have an example that's doing it right now. Um, one of the examples we'll look at later has some explicit co-array communications, but uh, oh, let's look at the uh, example that we saw here. So because of the inherent non-ordering of remote image access, the compiler would be allowed to see that you're going to do this assignment and move when that assignment happens on image two, right? So it, it, it would be allowed to see that, hey, only image two is going to do this. Um, so for image two, I'm going to move where this assignment happens up to um, the beginning of the program. And so it could start doing that assignment at the beginning of the program, knowing that no other image can know when this image started to do that. And then it can, and, but then it can also see, hey, I see that you're accessing data on that remote image. In between image control statements, the compiler is allowed to say, hey, I see you're going to access that down here. I'm going to start the access way up here while you're doing some communications so that the data is ready by the time you get to where you're going to need it. So uh, that is one of the benefits of the co-arrays model is that there are a lot of like overlapping of communications and com computations that the compiler is allowed to do as an optimization process for you without you having to think about it. Now, whether or not any of the compilers actually take advantage of that very heavily is up for debate. <laughs> You'd have to talk to that particular compiler writer and vendor uh, and ask them whether how how aggressively they take advantage of that. Um, any other questions? There was one earlier said, should one use MPI abort for non-standard determination? Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't do it in a co-array program because there's no guarantee that a co-array implementation is actually using MPI. Um, if you're using it in an MPI program, uh, sure. Um, there was one or two of those. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, the error stop. So error stop in a co-array program says everybody to asks the whole world to stop. All of the images will stop if any image calls error stop. But stop is actually collective operation. So um, if one image calls stop, what it will do is it will wait 
until all of the other images call stop. And so if, if, you, if you're writing a, a co-array program, do not assume that stop will cause the program to, to terminate. The other images might keep right on going and you're just going to end up in a waiting pattern, especially when it comes to things like deadlocks. So we talked about deadlocks yesterday in ways that you can you can introduce deadlocks into your program. Uh, some of the co-array features and the MPI features, they're really easy to introduce because of some of the semantics of the procedures and operations that you're going to do. So like we said, uh, sync all, we'll just take sync all as an example. Sync all is a collective operation. All of the images have to wait until all of the images have gotten to that same sync all statement with some, or, or a sync all statement at least. Um, so if one image has called stop and the rest of the images call sync all, they're going to be waiting on each other forever because that last image won't ever get to the sync all statement and the other images won't ever get to a stop statement. And so you'll, your program will just be in a deadlock. Um, same thing with the collective operations. If one image calls co-broadcast and another image called something else, um, they're going to be very confused about what communication they're trying to do. Uh, so yeah, like if one if one image calls co-broadcast and another image calls co-sum, uh, they might think that they're trying. One might think the other is trying to do the right communication, and they're going to be very confused about what what operation they're trying to perform. Um, you have to make sure you have to take care and make sure that you really are doing ordering your collective operations correctly. Um, let's see. Uh, there are distributed programming models that run at full machine scales and are not using something like co-arrays or MPI. Yeah, Chapel, Legion, Julia, Charm++, plus plus. yeah, those, those are all. And so, yeah, um, there, are, there are other communication libraries out there besides MPI that co-arrays could be implemented on top of. So there is no guarantee that um, a co-array feature in an MPI program will work correctly or that MPI using MPI features in a co-array program would work correctly. I think, I think that looks like most of the questions So I think we'll, I would say move on. However, uh, it is, uh, we've reached the point where it's probably time for our break for lunch. So we'll go ahead and take our break for lunch and just like yesterday, so we're a little early, um, we will come back at 1.30 central time. So that's 11.30 Pacific time. So you get 50 minutes for lunch. Uh, and then we'll meet back here and we'll go over some of the real world examples.